Well, the feed is live, so we'll just give it a, a couple of minutes to catch up and let people... I'm fine. Um, yeah, come on and see where we are. Um, bum, bum, bum. Do, do, do. Pin that to the top of the page. There we go. And then I'll write a post. Hi guys, if you're just tuning in, just the uh, normal messing about feed. Uh, Alyssa and uh, 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 episode 27 as always uh, we are sponsored by um, James Jeffries uh, and um, also uh, Amos Scaffolding um, for all your scaffolding needs uh, and no mean city clothing um, we wouldn't be able to continue were it not for the kind um, help that we get from there um, tonight we're speaking to Laura Brand uh, the siren of San Quentin um, thanks for coming on Laura it's been a long time coming yeah <laughs> this is my first UK interview that's, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm really blessed to be having you for your first UK. This is my first American interview, and my first proper international. Um, so it's great. I um, yeah, I, I think it'll be brilliant. Um, before we like get into uh, what you do and, and, and some of your knowledge and stuff like that, I'd like some you know my followers to know who you are. So can we go back to before you became a private detective? and all that and and how you grew up and you know how you ended up in in the journey that you're in now yeah <laughs> maybe story <laughs> well i started um reading nancy drew as a kid my dad would read me nancy drew books when i was a child and then it was probably in middle school or high, in high school i started reading you know the forensic psychology books the books by the profilers you know anything criminology or forensic psychology related so I just um, started writing papers, doing research. I was really young when I started. Um, and then I went to school for, for it. Um, so you, you, um, you, you had these dreams of, of, of being a, a private tech, but what about your uh, personal life? How did you sort of, uh, and I know you said that you, uh, you were sort of homeless for a little while. Can you tell us yeah, about that? that? It was probably, how old was I? Um, when I was like, right, 29 turning 30, um, I found out I was pregnant with my son, Romeo. Um, and the father told me to give up the baby. And if I didn't, um, I would be kicked out. So I was kicked out because I refused to give up the baby. Um, and this was when I was almost probably way past my second trimester. Um, so I was homeless and I had about $1,500 left to my name. And um, I'd been doing a serial killer study um, with multiple, multiple serial killers out of San Quentin for the last couple of years. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna give it my best shot. And I flew out there and I put, um, I did an interview with uh, Bitteker, uh, Wayne Adam Ford and Douglas Clark, the three of them. My plan was to write a book on the three of them, but it was when I got in the cage with actually Lawrence Bitteker. He was the one who drew me the maps. Um, of where the two girls are, Cindy and Andrea, that we're looking for, and where all the buried evidence is. So, um, for those who don't know, um, t tell me about uh, Bitica and, and Norris and uh, the whole two box, toolbox killers, um, for those who don't know in Britain. Well, 
the urban legend about the van of staying away from vans, don't go near vans, don't walk along inside of van, actually comes from the case of Bideker and Norris. They were, um, well, Norris was a sexual deviant. Um, Bideker didn't have any sexual priors, or at least that he was charged for, um, but they met at San Luis Obispo um, in California prison. And it was a group of them would sit around and actually talk about their deviant sexual fantasies. And they would actually start to write stories about it and just constantly day after day, um, writing stories and fantasizing, you know, it became a plan. Suddenly they're like, oh, when you get out, I'm gonna go to LA. They are both moving back to LA. You know, maybe we can get a cabin in the woods, but that leaves a paper trail. Uh, maybe we could get a van. Um, so they ended up getting a van when they got out and they actually named it Murder Map as kind of like why this case is known. And they pretty much pimped out their ride for the sole purpose of rape, torture, and killing. So they soundproofed it. They broke the locks off. They put a phone system in it. They put um, crazy gadgets for um, CB radios going at all times. So they have police scanners like listening to all the radio calls um, and a bed. And they're known for putting the toolbox under the bed, which is used for the torture of the girls. And that's how the name the Toolbox Killers emerged. Wow. Um, so how many, um, how many victims were there? Five um, that they were charged for. So, so the five that they were charged with, is there other ones that you suspect that there are, that are still out there that you're looking for? There's still a lot more, yeah. A lot as in a certain number? It's high 20s. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, Bitteker actually started... Um, way before Norris, way before Norris. Um, he actually kind of trained Norris in a way. And there was another serial killer with them um, in San Luis Obispo, who was also kind of training them in a way. So when Bitteker was um, a young teenager, he would steal cars and he got sent to juvie. So part of his juvie, they would send him up in the mountains of San Gabriel to fight fires. So he learned all these fire roads up in San Gabriel. And that's actually where they brought the girls. They actually broke off the locks of these fire roads up in California. Um, now these fire roads are only meant for like emergency personnel with the fire departments, uh, but they went up there and actually replaced it with their own locks. And Bitteker knew the fire roads in and out because of working up there as juvenile and he knew them like the back of his hand. So it's the fire roads is actually where they brought the girl and it's a very, very secluded area. I mean, it's just mountain terrain nothing for miles uh, that's 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 disturbing um are there any are there any survivors there are yeah yeah one of them is going to be on the show too um i'm going to see the other one um in 21 days robin and you'll get to see um kristen on the show that, that must be that, that must be really hard um so you, you've gone into um, speak to these people. Um, what's it like stepping into a cage with a serial killer? You know, it's. Um, I think for me, you know, it's it's just what I do. It's my research, and for me, it's like I can't wait to be in the cage. I can't wait to get into the prisons, and it's my laboratory. I just love it. Um, but for anybody else, it's can be really intimidating. I mean, you're going inside of a cage, a dog style, you know, kennel type cage, and they are taking the cuffs off of them. There's no cuffs on them and they're totally free. And you're just in this like tiny little cage with them. Yeah, Chris, is that um, now sort of infamous photo of you and Bissaker, is that right? Where you're sat in a cage and you're doing art? Yeah, that's Bittaker. He was actually, no, he was um, drawing the maps of where the girls are. So, so he, 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 he told you where all, all, all of them are? Or? Not all of them, just Cindy and Andrea. Wow. Cindy and Andrea, he was convicted of, but they could never uh, locate their two bodies. So actually in 21 days, I'm flying to Los Angeles. We're going to like, COVID has delayed stuff um, a lot <laughs> for yeah. everybody. So um, in 21 days, I'm going out there. I'm meeting up with the uh, survivor, Robin Robeck. Oh, and Kristen, the other survivor, she's coming down too. Um, and Andrea Hall's sister is coming out. We're all, um, we got Airbnbs, hotels, and 
we're just going to hit the ground running. We're going to go to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, all the police stations, all the uh, you know sites of the scene. We're going to go up in the fire roads. It's going to be really wild because it's going to be my first time going up in the fire roads as well as um, Andrea's sister. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that must be, um, I won't say exhilarating, um, but the certainly must be some anticipation there you must be anticipating on on like really finding uh, and and i suppose it's um closure for 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 the families yeah yeah um they have a burial plot for her i mean they put roses on there but you know her bones aren't there and her mother's uh, still alive uh, she's getting elderly but she's still alive so the hope is we can actually recover Andrea or partial remains to put in the plot before her mom dies. Because you know, these girls, um, their families, they haven't been able to have funerals for the girls even. So was, was there a specific type of girl? Blonde hair, blue eyes is what they went for. That was like their type type, but they were predators. So they took a lot of victims of opportunity. Um, three of the girls they're convicted of were actually brunette. So. I mean, if they saw a girl hitchhiking, if they saw a girl on a, you know, a bus stop, you know, any, anything, they would pick them up. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, so, a uh, bit, Bittaker's dead. Is that right? He, he he passed away not long ago. Yeah, he passed away right before COVID hit. Um, I went out there. I was with him three weeks before he died. Um, for my last round of interviews. We knew it was the end. We knew it was going to be the last time um, we ever got to speak and do more round of interviews. That's actually the picture you see in my profile of us drawing the maps. That, that's um, one of our last visits we had together. Um, but yeah, it was December 13th, 2019. And then Roy Norris, um, ironically, just happened to die like two and a half months later. Right. So without death row or only only Bitteker was on death row. Yeah, uh, Norris actually escaped the death penalty. And the reason being is because he testified against Bitteker. So the deal with them, Stephen Kay, who's the district attorney, was if you can show us where some of these bodies are, because they had no bodies, they had no evidence. Um, they actually came very close to actually getting away with everything. Um, it was really, they were really at the wire, but um, they got Norris turnover. Um, you know, that was Paul Bynum, Tom Crayer, the two lead investigators. They were in there with Stephen Kay uh, when they got, you know, Norris to finally roll over on Bitteker. And part of the agreement was they have to, Norris has to go in the mountains and actually point out where the bodies were. Um, and only Jackie and Leah were ever recovered. Whoa, so um, how were they caught? It was, it's a mixture of two things. Actually, Robin, who is the, one of the survivors I'm going to see in 21 days. She was um, raped by both of them. She was taken um, from a Hermosa Beach bar, um, but they let her go. And she went to the police and reported it. She was hospital, reported the rape. She was 19. Um, and she described two men with a silver band who had done this to her. Um, a couple weeks after her attack, um, Norris actually met up with another sexual predator. Like I said, there was a big group of them in San Luis Obispo, and a lot of them got out at the same time. Um, so they met at a Dunkin' Donuts, and ironically, <laughs> this is the Dunkin' Donuts where Kristen, the other survivor, was working, but she did overnights, and they had met just in the morning, so she would just missed Nor seeing Norris. Um, but he was there with uh, Jackson, who was another uh, serial rapist, and he says it was to confess. It was not to confess. He was trying to actually prime him into killing with them. Um, Norris then drove Jackson to eight different locations where he had been surveilling eight different girls. They had just bought an acid and chemicals. They were going to use these acid and chemicals to burn out the eyes and the ears of the next victims. Um, and Jackson got scared, so he went to the LAPD. The LAPD didn't take him too seriously, but they ended up calling out. Um, they called Hermosa and they talked to Paul Bynum. And they said, you know, we have this guy saying these guys are killing. Um, silver van, but you know, we don't have any bodies. He doesn't know where the bodies are. And Paul said, Send, I want to talk to him because Paul remembered Robin's statement of this two men with the silver van. So Paul went and uh, 
two other uh, detectives from Manhattan Beach also went with him. And, you know, Paul took him seriously. And they started, they went up to his partner, Tom and him, went up to Oregon because Robin had left the state after her attack. She didn't want, she didn't feel safe in California. They went up and they showed her a photo lineup and she picked them right out. Uh, they flew back and started surveillance on Roy Norris. Well, so it, um, how long was that sort of investigation? How long before they sort of caught up with them? See, Robin's attack, October 22nd, Lynette was murdered on Halloween night, and then it was um, November 11. Um, it was pretty much less than a month. It was about three weeks um, until Jackson went uh, to confess to the police. But then they started their surveillance and everything, and they were arrested on November 21st, officially. But they did about three days of surveillance on Norris first. Oh, my God. Um, so we, I presume this was um, sort of a, a what we call over here a big circus case um, over the, you know, lots of press and, um, and things like that. Were, were you there in the courtroom or...? Sorry, couldn't get to the last part. Sorry, were, were you there in the courtroom? How did, did you follow the case that way? Or how did you sort of, when did you get into the case? Um, well, this was all 1979, so nine years before I was born. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, but they have, um, it was the first case that was ever uh, videotaped in California. Um, right. Trial. Uh, so that was a big, big deal. It was the first um videotape trial um i'm still trying to track down all the footage there's some on youtube you can watch but the biggest thing is you can actually hear uh the tape they're known for their infamous ledford tape um you can actually hear 30 seconds of it outside of the courtroom and there is a clip of bideker actually on the stand uh testifying wow so um so roughly about 40 years then um so what 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 kind of relationship did you have with these people? Well, when I first um, it was two thousand fourteen when I reached out to both of them, and Bideker wanted no part to do with me. He didn't want to talk to me at all. And Norris was actually more open, more friendly, um, answering any questions I had. Um, and there was so much pushback from Bideker. Uh, so, but I just kept chipping away, chipping away. It took about three years three years until I was pregnant. It wasn't until I was pregnant he actually came around. So you were pregnant in, in, in some of those photos? Yeah. Wow. So you're not just a, a young woman going into um, like, like these, these, these prisons. Yeah, a pregnant woman. That must have taken some real guts, to be honest. I'm not sure. I... I you know, I've I've been uh, been around the block and I've seen a fair few things. I'm not sure I could have done that to be honest. Um, you know, uh, so you you've you've spoken to and studied about fifty. Is that right? Fifty serial killers. Yeah, one of them you played. <laughs> I I did I did I was going to get around to that. Yeah. So uh, earlier on in the year, I I was involved in a. A, a small production called Twisted, um, which was about a, a man called John Eric Armstrong, who um, was a deviant. He, um, from from what I was 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 told about the character, he went for sex workers, um, killed um, several young sex workers uh, with a pair of tights. Um, and there may be a lot of others out there. Um, he's recently, I don't know whether recently, but he opened up. Um, what can you tell me about him? Um, I'm trying to think, how can I describe him? Uh, he's actually very funny, hysterically funny. Um, he's, um, he's one of the ones you, I can go deep with, like he'll talk. He'll go, he likes to, um, you know, observe his own behavior, hindsight 2020. Uh, not all of them will do that, but I always like the ones that do. Uh, Wayne Adams Ford is another one. 
uh, Bitteker was one of them when I finally got him to open up. Uh, but yeah, he is one of them. Um, he'll go deep into his psyche or let me explore, I should rather say. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say too much about the program, but he, uh, um, you know, he he, he he did what, you know, he, he maintained that he was innocent for quite a long time. Um, and, and then when they got him on DNA, he, he wasn't too bright about it and sort of confessed. Um, he came across to me as, you know, he was a Navy man. Um, and came across to me as, as, as a sort of average Joe. But this man was, or is, um, really, really sick uh, in, in the way that he lured his victims, um, lured them for sex, and, and then murdered them brazenly, and then injected himself into the into the investigation you, you know he put himself forward and, and and claimed to have found one of the bodies i mean what what you, you know you've met him yeah what, what sort of person would do that you know it's very typical they like to you know inject themselves in the investigation um they love i mean they're always watching the papers the news and they, a lot of them are true crime fans themselves. They're reading a lot of the books, the same books that, you know, people who are into true crime are reading. They're watching the shows and um, they're watching everything, but especially on their case, you know, they will be watching the newspapers. That's why a lot of the times um, they'll manipulate the press, you know, the law enforcement will to try to, you know, lure them out. because so they know they're watching. Yeah, I mean, his it's, it's story was... Um... You know that he, the, the the girl that he'd found was, he 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 stopped. He was feeling ill and he stopped to be sick over a bridge, uh, and and saw the body, uh, and, and brazenly put himself into that that situation, uh, on the bridge, with the police, offering help. Um, yeah, that's that's a you little, know, and he, I, that's that's actually. Uh, <laughs> That's very brazen, even for a serial killer to go that far to really inject themselves like that deeply. So I would say, yeah, with him, that's way more brazen than we typically see. Um, but you'll see yeah, that I mean, a lot of sexual sadist too is, you know, it's all about control and it's not just like control over the victim. They want to have control over the investigation too. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've noticed about him and, and from what you've said about Bittaker and Norris is that there are there are survivors in there, um, you know. So with um, with Armstrong, um, there was one girl that um, sprayed mace in his face um, and managed to get away. Uh, there was apparently one a, a man um, that, that that had got away. Um, yet he still brazenly carried on without fear you know that that's that's that even to me I, you know i met some people with, with, with some bravado but that is wow well, it's, it's gonna, i think it's going to be in the special i'm pretty sure this i have over 10 hours of the audio recorded with Bittaker, but there was um in one one of the interviews i said uh how did you feel after the murder were you you know, panicked or that they were going to find you. And he said, no, why would I be panicked? And I was like, well, what did you feel? He's like, nothing. And I was like, were you worried at all? He's like, no, nothing. Didn't even think about it. But it, that's one of the audio clips um, that I have. I hope it is going to be on the show. Yeah. Uh, for, for those that don't know, Laura's doing a, a documentary for Oxygen who are part of the, I believe, the same company that, that I played Armstrong for. Um, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, so um, you, you, uh, Laura is, is, is going to be going into debt, so that's why I don't want to go too far into it. I want this to be more general about some of the people that she's met rather than just going far into the case, because obviously I don't want to spoil it for people. Um 
but yeah, I mean, back to Armstrong. I, I mean, it it disturbed me on set. Um, you know, um, I you know I had to play a scene where I went and laid with one of the corpses. That in a field at night. That really got to me. Um, knowing that he did this, he, he, he hit a girl in a field and went back, um, in essence, to defile the corpse. I mean, this guy, it, it just it kept stacking up and stacking up. You know, I got there at the start of the day not knowing who I was going to play, and then you know, I didn't even look into him. I didn't want to sort of... Um, I didn't want to play him from Google. I wanted to play him how I sort of well, but it just it, it kept stacking up and these things that it did. Oh, you you know, all of those girls and and all of those lives that it, that he took, um, with no remorse. I presume he's shown no remorse. Um. Yeah, I was gonna, well, I was gonna ask you this: Is how did you feel playing a serial killer, like actually pretending in that, was especially a real one? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know who he was, so that was a little easier. Um, I didn't really have too many lines; it was it was all played back in documentary style, um, you know. Um, it's going to be Trevor McDonald that's going to be um, narrating over the top. So that 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 was. The thing. But you know, at every part of the production, you know, two days I I was I, I was there, and it was just I don't know. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. It's like all right, you know, um, this scene, um, you're going to sit in the back of a car, um. And you're gonna throttle a, a young black girl with a pair of tights. Is that all right? And it's like, well, you know, I mean, I've met, I've, I've met some mad people in my time, but that's just, I, I suppose I, I, all I could do is push myself into it and and just play it. The best that I could, and and just hope that it was similar to how he um, how he was really, um, and do and do as I was told. But he just yeah, he just kept stacking up. All, you know, all, all all the girls that he you know, it'd be like you know, he's it, done that, and he, he just he got back in the front of the car and drove off. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we offered a girl. A cigarette got in the back of the car and throttled her in the back of the car I, I mean you know how else can you do it you know i've had a colorful life myself i've i've i've, I've been involved with um crime um i've, I've been involved uh, with violence and drugs and um even then i couldn't fully put myself into it because i found it quite upsetting you know, I'm not I'm not a professional actor by any standard, but um, you know, it was it was an experience. It, that's that's all I can say. It was an experience putting myself sort of in, in, into it, into into this character that I thought he was, but it was just. just psychopath through and through um you know and the carnage that he caused um you know knowing that it could be anywhere up to 30 people that he'd killed i mean how 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 am i how am i supposed to feel about that you know it's i i don't know you know you, you you've you, you've spent time around him um you know i don't know if i I could, yeah. you know, even when I 
read these like, articles about Michael C. Hall playing Dexter. Um, he says afterwards, like, like, I don't, sorry, my son. That's all um, right. you can go show him out if you need to. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, he even says, he's like, uh, when I wrap filming, um, I stop and I think, what have I just done? Because even just, even pretending, you know, um, doing it is still like emotional for us, you know, and, uh, but for a psychopath, even just doing it, it's just like nothing for them. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it was just how brazen he, he was. And I would imagine that that's pretty much a full on trait. You know, I think you have to be a, a, a certain, I won't say special, but a certain type of person to be able to, you know, I, I, I couldn't take a life, you know, I've, I've not been pushed that far yet. You know, I don't know what I could do in survival, but I, you, you know, to, to just do that, you know, um, I feel guilty, you know, I, I've, I've been hunting with family and I've, I've shot rabbits and pigeon and, you know, I felt really guilty about it, you know, um, I think, would you say that they're wired up different in, in the head? Do yeah. they have a, 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 an energy about them? Yeah, well, I mean, especially when you're looking at, like, antisocial personality. You know, what, what, what sort of energy did they have about them? Well, the, you know, when you have, like, antisocial personality, um, you know, whether it's, um, or, you know, a sociopath where it's learned behavior versus, you know, something they're born with. Um, but, yeah, the wiring, too. And like you said, when he had to go up and up and up, he kept, like, escalating. I mean, that's what happens is they're chasing almost like a dragon for this uh, sexual gratification. So their sexual deviancy keeps going up, up, up as they go. Yeah, I, su I suppose it would be once you've hit one barrier and you've gone through that, then it just keep, you know, I've, I've spoken to lots of people about addiction and I've you know I've looked into my own addiction and my own trauma um, you know and, and one thing is you know I, I, I spoke to a guy by the, the, the name of Aidan Martin a few weeks ago who wrote a book called uh, Euphoric Recall uh, and he was talking about having a um, uh, an addiction to pornography and how it um, it would level up every time because it, it you know, you'd see something, you'd get desensitised to it, and then you'd go to the next level, you get desensitised to that, and I suppose that's the same with the way that you treat people and with murder and, and, and serial killers. Um, you know, uh, having that sort of psychopathic personality, but, um, you know... You said he was a very, uh, he's a very funny man. Yeah. I mean, if you were to probably talk to, I mean, most of them when you sit and talk to them, I mean, if you, I would say if you were out on the street, let's say you just turned to somebody next to you and you were just talking, you know, they just seem normal, like completely normal. And um, you wouldn't, I mean, when people are like, oh my God, my next door neighbor, like you always hear that, like the shock of people, like they can't believe it. Um, that's because they seem so normal. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I've lost people in my family to murder. I've lost friends to, to, to murder. Um, and I, I know of the people that have done it. Um, and it's always seemed, well, they couldn't, they, they couldn't do that, you know, they were always sort of nice and pleasant. But I suppose it's 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 a mask, you, you know, I've, I've looked a lot into um, uh, normalising trauma, um, uh, trauma response, um, and the one thing that I've noticed about a lot of addicts and, uh, you know, a lot of people who, who are working with that, we wear things like masks, um, like uh, a sense of humour 
um, a um, a certain bravado. Um, we carry ourselves in, in, in a certain way uh, in order not f for people not to see through the cracks. And I suppose that that is the same with a serial killer, but more extreme. Yeah. The mask of sanity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, um, Henry, Henry Lee Thomas, you know, came across as a quite a nice person, <laughs> but wasn't, I mean, you know, I don't know too much about American serial killers, we have, we've got a few over here, but not, not like you know, they're, they're mostly sort of, no, I mean, you, you have a lot, we have a, a handful that are in, like the biggest prisons like like Wakefield and Franklin and things like that um you know uh, men like Ian Huntley um who murdered two girls not far down the road from us um you know two school girls um you've got uh um Ian Brady and Myra Hindley who, who are both dead now the most killers um Peter Sutcliffe, you know, we've got all these, the Yorkshire Ripper, we've got all these famous ones, but, you know, it's America being as big as it is, you have, like, a lot. Well, that's um, interesting if you actually added all of the other countries, you take America out, but add up every single other country, uh, number of serial killers, America actually still doubles the rest of the world's uh, numbers combined. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. We have um, a really um, problem with mass. Yeah, really. Um, and we also have a huge problem with our mass shootings, which you know about. We have shootings every week, um, you know, schools, movie theaters, that kind of stuff. So, you know, our crime rates and our violent crime rates are extraordinarily high over here. Yeah, we've had one school shooting and that was back in the back in the 90s in in a small town in scotland called dunblane um which is quite a quite a, quite a famous one we have like big control on guns whereas you it's in, it's, it's in your constitution um you know what's the difference between a serial killer and a spree killer for example well, there's mass, so the mass murderers are the ones who keep the guns. <laughs> they're the ones who go into the schools and um, movie theaters. So they just take the gun and kind of unleash. That's a mass killer. They're killing as many people as they can in one mass uh, spree. A spree killer will go on a spree of killing, but they'll do this within a couple of days. They'll typically maybe move locations, but they're on a killing spree but it's within a week typically. Now here is where it gets, um, now a serial killer is much different than a spree or um, a mass. I mean, there's a totally different psych psychopathy behind it, but there has to be a month uh, cooling off period. So there has to be one month from one victim to the next victim, the cooling off period. Um, yeah, and there's always um, a signature, most of the time pregnant, um, pregnant <laughs> uh, present uh, with every serial killer too. Right, okay, so I suppose it's more calculated, planned. Yeah, oh yeah. So, so, so you're looking at, so you, you mentioned Dexter, um, and, and you know, we, 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 we see these, um, films and these series i've never seen dexter personally but you know i i know of it um i've seen things with serial killers in um you know um how realistic are they to um to the way that they're portrayed um to what they are in reality i mean it's very uh hollywood and um not uh uh, yeah, it's very Hollywood. They're not like as typical. I'm trying to think if there's like a good example of one I've seen that was really portrayed. Um, I do like how Dexter though really does like you hear his inner monologue a lot. 
And you kind of see like he he's acknowledging that he's not feeling anything, acknowledging that he's wearing a mask of sanity. So you kind of, and I mean, that's all true, that happens. Um, and they do question like why they're not having feelings sometimes and why they're not having the emotions like we do. And that's why actually sometimes if you actually talk to them, they almost seem delayed. It's almost like, it's very, very subtle. I look out for it. It's, it's almost like a second or two second. But the best way, it's something I do in the prisons is I shock them. I'll say a shocking statement um, and I'll just sit there stone faced watching them, waiting for them to react because you see psychopaths are waiting for you to react and show emotion because they have to mimic it back. So if you say something shocking and then sit there and wait for their reaction and they have no reaction, you know, that's a big indicator too. There's a lot of different little tactics you can use to kind of pick up on it, um, but that is one. And uh, sarcasm actually goes over their head too. So you can, if you want to, <laughs> uh, you know, ever think somebody is or has the personality traits, uh, sarcasm they have to, they can't handle. Wow. Yeah. So, um, I struggle to find to know the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath. Can you explain that for me? I'm I'm a, I'm a bit. I always explain to people, you know, psych is like psychology of the mind, so it's something you're born with, uh, nature, and then uh, so sociopath. That's from nurture. That's a learned behavior. Right. Okay. So, would you say? with Bittaker and Norris, um, Bittaker was more of the psychopath, and although Norris had psychopathic tendencies, he was more sociopathic? They're both... Oh, off. No, they're, they're both clinically diagnosed with antisocial personality, a uh, psychopath. Um, but that's a big thing that is going to be on the show and in the book and you're going to hear about. Um, right before Bideker died, uh, there was the prison psychologist noticed a change in um, psychopathy and had flown in experts to um, actually talk to him. Uh, and he had told me about it and I actually didn't believe him. I said, if you, I was like, you have to send me the psych evaluations. So he got copies and sent them over to me, which were really fascinating. Um, so some, there was some type of dam breaking um, at the very end of his life. Um, and, you know, maybe that's why he gave up the girls. I think it was a mixture of everything, you know, um, the stars aligned. I was in there pregnant. I think being in there pregnant was, you know, a lot of mommy issues. It wasn't just Bittaker. Uh, I interviewed Douglas Clark when we had him forward. And it was very, it was de definitely a different type of interview being in there pregnant. Um, Cause I think it was more like emotional for them. I think those. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you said that you have to break these people down, you know, in, in, in statements and stuff like that. And I suppose that walking into one of these prison cells, visibly pregnant would be sort of, um, what's the word surprising uh, uh, at least um it would certainly um open up an interest i would i, I would believe um yeah uh well yeah it's, and it's, i was it wasn't like i was a little pregnant i was seven and a half months i was really huge and um they had never seen it. Correctional officers had never seen it. Like it's never been done before, but um, even the, you know, the prison staff was shocked. Um, it had a visceral reaction from pretty much everybody at San Quentin. Yeah, I mean, you, you've, you've certainly gone in there and you've broken barriers, you know, um, a young woman pregnant, um, and you've, you've, you've just gone in and, and you've got him to or them to sort of confess and open up uh, is, 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 is drawing your maps. Um, how much of that is um, regret? Sorry, hang on. Thank you, mate. Um, how much of that is regret and how much of that is bravado, do you think? Just see, look what I've done. 
Um, you know, when he was really, like when he was drawing everything initially, um, it was more matter of fact, Lee. Um, but it was probably when the cancer diagnosis came in um, and um, his own like impending doom, I would say that's what you saw. Um, so do you think it was a, do you think it was him with a need for a, um, for an ending or was it a need for him to go on being remembered or, you know? It's a hard question to answer only because it's just a big part that's going to be on the show. Right. That's the only reason I'm hesitating, but, uh, uh, you know, and honestly too, I think, um, I'm really curious when everybody like finally, you know, hears it for themselves. I mean, every, everybody's going to be hearing all the audio themselves of those 10 hours and those last captured interviews before you die. Um, and you're going to hear from me and you're going to hear from, you know, the girl who lived, Tracy, who lived right next door to him in the motel where he was in the killing. She was close to him. And then you're going to hear from Jackie Gilliam's best friend, Kitty. You're going to hear from Stephen Kay, the district attorney. You're going to hear from Mario Tool, the FBI profiler who interviewed him back in the 80s. You're going to hear from Kristen, one of the survivors. Um, you're really going to get to hear from, every oh, Andrea's sister is also on there. Um, just everybody on this connected to this case, some really groundbreaking interviews. And then my interviews with Bitteker as well. And um, really, uh, really groundbreaking interviews. I can't give too much away, but it's going to be, it's going to um, shock people to their core. That's all I can say. And I'm curious after everybody sees them and hears them, what's everybody's opinion too. Yeah. I, I think that over the past sort of five, ten years, the uh, documentaries have got more advanced in, in the fact that, you know, uh, um, being, we can find out more, we, we, you know, we can look into the entomology of the cases, um, it can be pulled apart, um, you know, all the evidence, um, and we're just in a time now where it's not guesswork anymore, you know, we've got the internet, it's, it, it, it's really sort of pushing it forward, um, but they are getting, in, in the fact that they are getting more shocking, um, I suppose it's because these are things that we we sort of desensitized to in the fact that we see them on in fiction a lot. We read it in fiction, we see it on TV in fiction, we see it in films in fiction. But this is real life. Um, these people next door could be the people next door to you, um, and that that for me um, is certainly more grounding than anything else. Um, so tell me about the study that you did then, about uh, the serial killer study with the 50 plus serial killers. Um, so that started, when did I start? I, that was back in 2014. Um, I just partnered with uh, Dr. White. Um, He's gonna help me analyze all the findings on this study so far. So it's comprised of um, 80 questions that was asked to these serial killers and we have their answers back to back and we're looking at the correlations, the differences, that kind of stuff right now. It's analyzing, we're trying to scale it, personality scale it wise. Um, but we actually are gonna start presenting on it in 2022. Uh, we, him and I have a homicide. It's only open for law enforcement, but we're gonna be presenting there. We have four hours um, to present on it, which is really cool. Um, so that's gonna be like our debut of presenting the study um, and we are gonna publish it. Um, officially, and I think that's also going to be another huge uh, eye opener for people too, is seeing uh, you know all the, their answers to some of these questions, and they're very very deep deep questions too. So apart from uh, the ones that we've spoken about, like Bittaker and Norris and um, and Armstrong, who for you 
was the most shocking? Um, Bitteker, honestly, was the most shocking, only because he was uh, so challenging. You know, for three years, he was so challenging, and then it was just like a 180, and and then the two-year roller coaster that him and I went on uh, before his death, um, because we were on the phone every day working on this case. He had sent me the police discovery, the court transcripts, autopsy reports, so we were working crazy hard on it, and, um, you know, and digging into his entire past with everything, so definitely him for most surprising. Wow. So he 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 was on death death row, um, but he'd been on there for what thirty forty years. Yeah. He um. So, so he, how how come they hadn't? Well, with him, his case is um very strange because well he has a one thirty eight IQ, so he would just go and read at the law Aye. library, and he learned how to um he learned the law like how to, and he learned how to manipulate the law. So he started, uh, he would file all these frivolous lawsuits. He's known for filing, filing <laughs> these crazy lawsuits. He, uh, he even did a lawsuit for um, a broken cookie. There's a reader, Reader's uh, Digest article about it. It's a very well-known article um, because he sued the prison over a broken cookie because that's against his civil rights <laughs> was his claim. Um, wow. Yeah, but it was in 1990, he actually filed a habeas corpus for the uh, California Department of Justice. Now, for a death row inmate, um, if they have anything filed within the court system, they cannot be executed. And all the appeals have to be filed, you know, nothing can be withstanding in, the court, in court um, for an execution to actually go through. So this habeas corpus that he filed um, in 1990, it was still actually active up until his death, which is unheard of. But he knew how to yeah, the law and knew how to manipulate it. And he had a, so 1990, yeah, he had a nearly 30 year habeas corpus filed. Wow. Uh, that, the, and that was over a cookie? No, that was, the cookie was, or was different. That over something else. Yeah, he filed so many frivolous uh, lawsuits. They actually, California had to actually um, make a law. It was only, only one lawsuit uh, per inmate at a time. And that was because of Bitteker. Yeah, I mean, it kind of does take the, the 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 mick a little bit. I mean, part of me can't help but sort of admire his bravado. Um, you know, I've met a few sort of jailhouse, jailhouse lawyers in my time. Um, yeah. you, you know, but that is just, I mean, to manipulate... You know, a, a 138 IQ, that, 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 that certainly isn't small. Um, and then to be able to use that to manipulate the not just the people around him, but the, the justice system, um, you, you know, the whole uh, thing that, you know, part of the thing that holds uh, America together and, and, and is sort of, I won't say making a joke of it, but, you know, he was certainly putting some red faces in... in within the local government, I would imagine, and within the local place. Yeah. So how did that go down? I, I presume it didn't go down very well with the state. <laughs> no, uh, no, they, that's why they had to pass the law to make it, you know, one at a time. I mean, because he would just file, file, file um, and find, he kept finding the loopholes and he kept just doing it. Yeah, just burying them in paperwork. Yeah. That's clever. Yeah. That's 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 very clever. So t tell me about some of the other um some some of the other people that you've met. Have you met any female ones? Are there yeah. any female serial killers? They're rare. Um they're very rare. Um but I actually I would love to interview a female and see the differences between the male and the female. Yeah, um I would imagine that I mean, that's down to societal um, as well, isn't it? Um, I get requested uh, to interview. Yeah, so can... Uh, Jody, everybody wants me to uh, interview uh, Jody Arias. That's the biggest request I think I get for the female. So, so, t tell me about her. 
do you have you guys heard about her over in England? Maybe you guys haven't heard about her over there. Um, she was the one who uh, no. she, uh, killed her boyfriend. Um, it was very, very violent, stabbed him uh, multiple times. Um, it was a really, it was a, it's a very brutal, brutal murder, um, which isn't that typical for a female. Um, and she was small. It wasn't like she was like that big. And, but she, um, I mean, she just eviscerated him. So that's, uh, she's one of the ones I always get uh, asked if I'll ever go interview her. Um, so what about males? Who, who would be the, I mean, I, I know you've done the Bittaker and Norris case and, and this was part of your life for such a long time, but who, who would be, you, you know, putting aside Armstrong and, 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 and people like that, um, who's sort of probably someone that you, 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 you'd like to go and uh, look at? Um, still, still alive to this day? Still alive, yeah, yeah. Think of who I haven't. Um, you know, I think uh, it's a cliche. I feel like everybody says him, but I think it's because he's inter introspective. I, I would like to do Ed Kemper. I think he would be a good one to interview. I haven't interviewed him. Um, there are a couple that I would. That I haven't, but I would like to. I've, I've heard the name. Mm -hmm. He was. I, 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 I've heard the name, but have you seen the show Mindhunter? They depicted him on season one. I haven't, unfortunately. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Yeah. Is he the sort of guy next door? Um, I don't know if he was like the guy next door. Um, he has a really uh, crazy history. He actually killed his grandparents, you know, in his teens. He was released. With, he had a very um, horrible relationship with his mother, um, which is something typical I see with like almost all of them is there's some type of breakdown with the mother relationship, the parental um, relationship with the mother. I mean, it sounds very cliche, but it's, it's, uh, it happens. I see it a lot. Yeah. Um, familial breakdown from from the stuff that I've 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 read about you know some of the um British killers and stuff like that a family breakdown seems to be a big contributing factor um is you know is it down to the person um, breaking that breaking down those barriers or is it just down to um I, I suppose just just pure bad luck at, and the family just breaking down. I suppose there would be circumstances around it. Um, the one thing that I thought about in thinking, you know, you know, in, in retrospect about Armstrong, is that you know, to 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 a certain extent, he was a loner. Um, But, you know, what was, you know, thinking about the circumstances, you, you know, it'd have to be a certain way in his head. Uh, and then you've got that with um, familial breakdown, um, you know, trauma, uh, grief, whatever, all, all these things are contributing factors. Uh, and it, it just, I, I guess it just be kind of, is it a fluke or, you, you know, are there certain things that are a breeding ground for this sort of behaviour that, you know, can it really turn a, can bad circumstance turn a good man into a, a serial killer? Yeah, it's, it's like you said, you know, bio, psych and social elements, they're all coming together. Um, it's like taking a gun and loading it and pulling the trigger pretty much, you know, you have the perfect storm kind of, um, coming together and it's, it's, you know, when it comes together and it touches down, you know, that's where you get the fear of it, but it, yeah, just a mixture of a perfect storm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, I just, 
I suppose it all go, for me it all goes back to why, you know, why somebody could do that. You, you know, in the animal world, you expect it. You expect the brutal, that, that brutality, but you, you, you know, you, you really don't expect it. Um, and and like I said before, these, these you know the people that I've had experience with. Um, in, in in my past, you you wouldn't think they'd say boo to a goose, but there's obviously something there. There's there's, there's something ticking away, and then the circumstances that have happened, and it, it's that's it. It's just I, I I suppose it's just a ch total change in personality. Um, then again. You know, maybe I'm babbling, but you know, then again, it, it goes back to being desensitized to what we see. You know, we see all these things like Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger, and you know, there's obviously some psychology to those killers, but um, he, you know, are we really that desensitized as a society that? You know, we, 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 we see these people and it's like, you know, somebody's brought out as a serial killer and it just doesn't surprise us anymore. Um, you know, I, I think it's most surprising. I think it's, you know, um, for trauma responses, especially, you know, it's, I think it's, I think it's um, well, everybody responds to trauma differently. And I always say, you know, always remember hurt people, hurt people. Um, so some people might respond to trauma, the majority, you know, they'll grow from it. They actually devote their lives to helping others. A lot of them become self-sabotaging, you know, they'll turn to drugs and alcohol. It's like a classic example, but one out of five, um, actually become abusers themselves from trauma. Yeah. So, um, you know, coping skills is a big factor from that as well. Yeah, I mean, I've had some real trauma in my life, um, you know, some, some very real abuse, very real trauma, um, violence, um, you know, from, from, from a, a younger age, and my response, my trauma response was to go into myself and use drugs and uh, that became habit and then that became addiction, addictive personality. Um, however, I didn't turn out to be a serial killer. You know, I could have been, I suppose. You know, there have been times when I've, I've been violent and I've had somebody by the throat up against the wall and I've really wanted to do some serious damage. And it's only um, circumstance that stopped me doing it. And then, you know, what you say about self-sabotage, that's, that's a big thing with addiction, that's a big thing with trauma. You know, we, 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 we start to have something nice and then we think we don't deserve this. And we, we, we sabotage it. But still, you know, I'm not a serial killer. And the people that I know that work in trauma, that have been through trauma, that are really doing good work in building a trauma-informed society, um, you know, uh, people like Jay Haston, um, it's, you know, not, not serial killers. I, it, there's got to be something else. Yeah, like you're, there's got to be something else that 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 X factor that everybody calls it, or what they refer to, like the, that one X factor. Of what could be a predisposition that could lead into this, pretty much? Um, yeah, I mean they're looking at. So uh, what is? No, uh, oh, I was going to say they're starting to look at genes now. Um, which I just started doing um, training with the Red Graves um, on genealogy and everything. It's so fascinating. Um, and one of the things they're looking into is they call it the warrior gene. And they're finding out that um, 
more can have this gene. And I honestly think it can be not even just psychopathic or, um, you know, someone who's capable of murder. I think law people who go into law enforcement, private investigators like myself, I think they have this gene and it's, um, you're just more of a hunter by nature by having this gene. So, but I think um, there's a lot more research on every end, you know, we have to do not even, I'm talking psychology, genealogy, sociology, um, neurology. So you're taking in all these factors and we need so much more research um, on this type of subject. And, you know, this is why I'm going into the prisons like I am and asking the questions and doing the studies is we're so um, far behind from where we should be. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's just extremes, really. Uh, you know, I've been very blessed in, 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 you know, since I've started doing this um, and, and, you know, writing and stuff like that. You know, I've met... Um, I've met escapees of human trafficking. I've met human traffickers. I've met, um, you know, I've I've spoken to uh, soldiers. I've spoken to convicted terrorists. I've spoken to gun runners. I've spoken to bank robbers. I've, you, you know, I've spoken to all these people that people would see as the dregs of society. Um, but they all have one thing in common. I should say we all have one thing in common is that we all have that desire to educate um, on a not going into a certain way of life to educate on how to deal with trauma at the earliest possible time so we can tackle it um working on trauma responses um we all have uh, a a want a need to um really i won't say redemption but you, you know it's 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 down close we, we you know we we have a desire to teach people that there is a better way of life than crime there is a better way of life than drugs and that trauma that you're feeling isn't your fault and that trauma might not belong to you um uh, and, and dealing with that and you know all these people from different ways of life um they've all gone down the sort of same road because they haven't dealt with trauma co correctly and I suppose on the flip side of that, that is where you would get people, you know, people like Armstrong. I don't know if Armstrong had any real trauma in his childhood or, you know, if Bitsker and Norris did or uh, Henry Lee Thomas. Um, is it Henry Lee Thomas? Um, no. It's, no, it's, Henry Lee. So you're thinking about Henry Lee Lucas? That's the one, Lucas. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, people like that. I, you know, I, um, I think for most of the most publicised ones, anyway, um, have had some sort of abuse, um, and like you said, turn, you know, you know, some turn abuser, um, the the bully turned the bully, um. You know that's kind of my experience anyway. You know, I was I was bullied a lot when I was a when I was younger, and then when I found out that I actually wasn't that fragile, that I could take a punch, that I could punch harder. That's when sort of that other person came out, and that's there's a far cry between who I am now and who I was then. You know, there's, there's uh, I'm, I'm seven years clean on Sunday, and the difference between that man and this man sat here is massively different. And there are people in my life, in my family, uh, that don't believe that men can change. They don't believe that I've changed. Some believe that. You know, it's kind of a mask that I'm wearing. 
Um, whereas I believe um, that old me died in, in that crack house and the new me was born out of out of the hospital uh, for, you know was born from trauma really um it was a very traumatic time um so i guess um it's how we personally respond inwards to trauma yeah that defines the way that we become you you responded to your job by coming a um yeah, a private, yeah. private investigator you know you you have a a, a need and a want for for justice which i think most normal people want they hate the fact that there is injustice out there and there is so much injustice out there yeah you know, uh, I mean, I'm now looking into miscarriages of justice with some people, you, you know. Um, there's, there's a guy that uh, I'm hoping to get on in a, in a few weeks time called Kevin Lane that, that spent, I think it was 13 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit, uh, for a murder he didn't commit. Um, you, you know, my need is to give, I didn't have a voice. I didn't feel I had a voice. I couldn't read or write until I was an adult. I didn't believe I had a voice. And when I found my voice, I swore that I would give a voice to other people. Hence this, really. This was me working with a guy called uh, Jason Edwards, who's a hostage and barricade negotiator. He was my first ever guest. Uh, and it's, it's me working on my trauma, uh, on my trauma response, on... Um, things like um, not self-sabotaging, um, working on my um, fear, I suppose. Doing this was stepping over fear. I was always comfortable be, be, being behind a camera, but being in front, that was a very different, especially when it was showing who I really am. I spent so many years in lies you know, i was a con man for many years um and i think most people would agree with that um and i was a sort of person and then to i i i, I could be anybody which is why i like acting sometimes because i could be anybody however to be honest we have to open ourselves up and these say you know i like to be as honest as i possibly can when doing these things because if i expect my guests like you to be open and honest it's not just courteous but it's i think it, it, it's it's necessary actually, because you, well as i was going to say that's actually the stance i have with the inmates when i go into is um i want them to be honest with me, I have to be honest to them. Um, and you have to open up. And even in the book um, and in the show too, um, I had uh, two really horrific uh, things that happened within three years of each other. Um, a family member of mine had killed my best friend. Um, and then it was right after that, I had become pregnant and then homeless. Um, and like you said, it depends on how we handle the trauma. Like I became a PI, um, you know, nobody was searching for these girls. Uh, I had to do something for it, about it. That's admirable. That's admirable. I suppose it's these things that define us. You know, I, I'm not the man that, that I was by any means, there's, there's still parts of him there, y you know, uh, parts that are, uh, are embedded in the, excuse me, in the personality. But I suppose that the way that I'd lived my life, um, there was only one thing that I could become, and that's a teacher. Um, because I believe that even, that, that we should teach, and even if we can't teach, 
we should teach. Um, you know, um, we should be a teacher. Um, and, and that's all I, I, I want to do because there's this combined wisdom through all these people that have helped me through. Um, you know, my, my wife is a quite a, a wise woman. Um, you, you know, the, the people that I surround myself in now are wise. Um, and they, they, they've taught me a, a different way of life. Uh, and, and to do that and, and to sort of get that combined knowledge, um, all we can do is, is kind of pay it forward. Um, so my need uh, through all the trauma is to educate. Your need is justice. Um, yeah, I have friend, uh, a friend uh, by the name of uh, Terry Ellis who's uh, quite a well-known bank robber over here. He spent many years behind bars. Um, he's just written a book called Verizon. Um, you know, he, he pulled off a very brazen um, armed robbery dressed as police, Ocean's Eleven style for a hundred million pound. Um, and he found God in prison. Uh, a, a lot of people that I've spoken to, including myself, um, have some sort of faith. Um, and we all have that need to educate. Whereas Terry, not only does he want to educate, he um, he has a, a very hyped sense of justice um, because he can see he's seen people. Yeah, you know, he spent time in prison with Kevin Lane, who who was there for a murder he didn't commit. We have a very uh, quite famous journalist over here by the name of Raphael Rowe, who was um, spent, I think it was 18 years behind bars, um, who now presents uh, world's uh, most dangerous prisons, um, for, you know, for a murder he didn't commit, which was the M25 murder, um, because he was black, he was pulled in because he was black. Um, you know, so it's it's men like that uh, and, and people like you that are really pushing forward on the um, on the justice front. Um, I think people need to see this because, like I said earlier, there is a there's an inherent sense of injustice in our society, especially now with everything that's going on with the pandemic and, you know, a government that couldn't, couldn't scratch their own backside, in, in my opinion, but I don't want to get into politics, but, you know, the, the, these are all societal problems and it, it's, it's getting worse. And I, I guess kind of I, I'm, uh, what I'm bothering about is that, um, I'm sorry if I do go into a <laughs> kind of a rant, but, you know, these people are coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, well... You know, especially in America, we have such a broken justice system. We have a broken prison reform system. Um, Europe is actually, I think, light years ahead of us. Um, uh, I actually want to go over and study in Europe um, within the prison systems and actually bring it back here. They're starting to do it in a couple of states. Oregon's doing it. They're sending over correctional officers and wardens to study in some of um, the cities over in Europe um, that are light years ahead. Uh, way lower crime rates and rehabilitation um, numbers are astronomical. Um, so we're just starting to do that here in America. Uh, but we got to look at the differences of what's working and what's not working. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, this is, this is what uh, Terry would say and, and what I say. Um, I think in, 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 in both of our countries, the prison system is not fit for purpose. Um, you know, people think that when you go to prison, you should be keep on punished. But you go to prison for the crime. That is your punishment. I, I know um, men that have spent time on prison roofs in the 90s, uh, Alan Lord in specific, um, 
to fight for the human rights of British prisoners. Because back in the day when I was in jail, there wasn't nowhere near what there is today. Um, it was more Victorian in, in feel. Um, so, you know, you've got that. It's about heads. It, it, it's about heads to feed, bodies to feed, um, boxes to tick, forms to fill. Um, to get out of prison here, all you need is a postcode where you're going to. I don't know if it's the same in America. So the problem is that people that are doing the longest sentences um, and we've got a new breed of criminal that, are, that have, you know, they've been to college and, you know, then they're getting taking the places in education. They're doing degrees because that looks good for the prisons. And then you've got people like I was that couldn't read or write their own name. Um, but that doesn't fill boxes, you, you know, uh, I suppose uh, the equivalent would be your guys getting a, is it a GED um, over there and then, you know, getting university qualifications and things like that. Um, but they're few and far between, so, you know, you, you, you're getting your roadmen that are getting sent down and you know all you see all the sea out the window is like road and that's what we call it road the asphalt um by the gate and that's all it is road all you see is road so you're getting taken from your circumstances you're getting put into prison you're serving your time you've been punished you get out and you're getting put straight back in to the situation that you were in before you got put in prison. And then you're caught in that vicious circle. And I suppose, you know, it's like that in, in, in America fully. Yeah, um, and then, well, especially in America too, it's, it's, it's not just I mean, it's, it's profitable. Um, you know, for them to have crime and it's profitable for the, you know, the private prisons, it's, it's very, it's just a mess over here when it comes to that kind of stuff too. Um, I mean, I don't know much about, about the American prison system. Um, you've got two types of prison, is that right? You've got federal and state, is that right? Yeah, but then there's now that we also have private too. Um, so right. And typically for like the privates, there's typically a quota of how many beds need to be filled because it's a private. Um, so, you know, if they need this many bed, they're turning, you know, it starts to become a numbers game for crime, which is crazy, crazy. Um, um, so, yeah, it's it's a mess um, where we're at right now. And then I think I think people are starting to wake up and see, starting to see how bad uh, it really is over here. So what's the difference between state and federal? Well, the federal is that's like a federal crime. And then the state is when the state um, persecutes you. So with California, um, so each state is different with the death penalty too. Some states have the death penalty. Some states don't have the death penalty. So a lot of things in America will go state by state. Um, and there's different laws for state by state. Uh, uh, there's different laws, like something could be legal in one state and illegal in another state. Um, Massachusetts, uh, marijuana is legal, um, just went to Texas, it's illegal. Um, and that happens all over the country. It's, there's a lot of different, um, you know, um, laws. Uh, but yeah, with the same thing, especially for the death row inmates, you know, some states have it, some states don't. Um, and, but we're starting to, I think in California, they're starting to actually get rid of the death penalty. A couple of the states are moving away from that. Um, some states like Oregon are moving towards, you know, rehabilitation. You know, they're going to study in Europe with the, the prisons that are actually working there with the rehabilitation. Um, so, I mean, we're making little um, strides. I mean, but we still have light years to go for where we really should be or need to be. Yeah, I mean, I know that um, 
But I mean, the, the, is it New York that has the death penalty, but they don't use it? Um, there are states that haven't used it in many years that still have it. Yeah, every like I said, every state's different and weird, and they have their own thing. And um, one of the questions I always get asked is, "Oh, how did you become a PI?" And I always say, um, and it'll be somebody from like you know uh, Illinois asking me, or somebody from Florida, and I'm always like, "You have to look it up by state because even you know licenses when you have to get your license, um, it goes by state." So the requirements are different. Like I'm working right now on getting my California license, my PI California license. Um, mm -hmm. And the qualifi qualifications are different in every state. Um, California requires 6,000 investigative hours worked. Um, a state like Florida, it actually goes through the Department of Agriculture, um, which is kind of weird. <laughs> so yeah, it's very weird how it um, is state by state, but that's how it is with the laws and the license. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I looked into um, becoming a a, a a private investigator over here. It used to be quite simple. Um, anybody anybody could become one. You know, thirty years ago, anybody could become one. Uh, but now uh, you have to go through um, what's called SIA. Um, but I personally can't um, become a licensed um private investigator because um there's a there's a, a moral integrity clause i think it is so anything that's anybody that's been in prison can't legally become a private investigator here however the way around it is anyone can become a journalist and anybody can become an investigative journalist which is what i'm now looking into um and, and there is a, there's, a, there's a massive difference, um, you know, uh, one you have to go through private security and the other one you have to go through um, education. So, y y you, you know, it's, it's, it's different here as well. But um, as a private investigator, what sort of things do you, you know, we, we see them on, on TV. Um, surveillance and stuff like that. But what what sort of things did you learn that that you you didn't think you'd need to learn? Um, honestly, it's all surveillance, um, <laughs> pretty much. And it's uh, I've always loved I love doing surveillance. Um, uh, mobile surveillance is much harder than it looks. Um, I think it would be easy, but no, it's it's actually much much harder. Um, but it's a skill, it's really, there is a learning curve on, because you know, you have to be a ghost, but you're still following somebody, but you can't be noticed and you got to be taking their picture and video at all times of them. And, um, you know, look, you're scrolling through all their social media, you're looking at their family, friends, you're looking at where they were and pinpointing and you're pretty much just stalking them pretty much, but you know, they can't see you or know that you are. Um, and if you get made, you know, you have to be off the case. You have to call and we'll take you right off the case if you do. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, there's definitely a big learning curve with uh, surveillance. And um, then when I started working with, uh, you know, on the Bitteker Norris case, and I had to start going to like the investigative reports and the court transcripts and doing all that, um, which I mean, it's like 10,000 pages of just research and you're analyzing all of that. And then you have to um, go back. And with Bitteker and Norris, I had over. 250 witnesses I needed to track down. Um, and I had to track them down 40 years later. <laughs> and most of them no. were teenage girls. So now I was up against a 40 year time period, which means they could be, they probably aren't even in the state of California. They could be all over the United States and they were. Um, so I had it to, to work against that time frame, uh, change last name. And then even on top of that, which was so, uh, it drove me crazy. Shout out to my research partner, Amy, because it drove her crazy too. We spent 15 hours a day. We would text each other at three o'clock in the morning, be texting at 7 a.m. You know, the next day, trying to track down these witnesses. And the police reports back in 1979 are kind of sloppy. So a lot of the girls' names were actually misspelled or phonetically spelled. <laughs> so we might have had a name. Um, like we had a uh, Dina, uh, shout out to Dina, she's probably watching. Um, but we had three different spellings of her name. 
uh, same with Tracy, her name was spelled like three different spellings. It was a miracle we were able to even track them down <laughs> to this day. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, there was, um, when Leah jumped out of the van, there was one girl who jumped out of the van and um, in front of the tennis courts at Manhattan Beach and people were actually playing tennis and Bideker went up and um, just punched her in the face. Threw her, she's 13 years old. Throws her back in the van and he says, you're high on LSD, I'm just trying to get you home and like jumps back in. Um, but somehow uh, I was able to track down <laughs> all the people in the tennis courts that were there and witnessed it. Um, so I've done like to say, I've done a massive um, investigation is like an understatement. I've gone back and talked to every single person. There was a lot of people um, I would call and they're like, how did you get my name? Because they weren't mentioned. They took a lot of the names out of the court transcripts because a lot of them were teenagers. They didn't want to, you know, re-victimize them. Um, but they were kept in these sealed police files. See, I was never supposed to have these sealed police files. The only reason I got them was because Bideker had gave them to me. Um, every inmate is allowed a copy of their police discovery so they can work on their own case. So he gave me his. So when I was tracking down a lot of these people that were teenagers, um, they were saying, how did you even get my name? It was because we had these sealed files and um, I was able to track them down. That takes some patience. I mean, you know, I, I like to research, but that just, that must have been so tiring and, and, and vexing. Um, you know, I, I suppose the closest that I got to it was um, one of the projects I'm going to be working on that I've kind of been working on since 2016 um, is uh, a guy by the name of Jim Maloney and he, he, um, he was accused of being in the IRA, uh, selling guns to the IRA uh, in a, uh, from a small town uh, in England uh, called Markham, a small seaside town. Um, and he sent me um, 1,300 pages of transcripts and, and you know interviews and um, court transcripts and it's it's just uh, I think one of the reasons I haven't got to go through it is because it's just so hard so much hard work yeah. it's just you've got to go through it with a fine tooth comb you, you've got to have a you've got to be in a certain frame of mind um, very, very some of it is down to yeah yeah, I mean, some of it for me is down to being a parent um, and, and not always having time. But, you know, there's the excuse there that they're at school and I could be doing it during the day. Um, but I just, at the moment, I can't get my head around it. Um, I take some real dedication to, to push through all of that and, and skill as well, I would imagine, to find out who who's relevant and who isn't because i would imagine some of those witnesses aren't always reliable so i suppose you've got to have a quite a good what i call bullshit filter to be able to filter through some of that crap um you know how do you choose the people that you speak to or do you just push on through and contact everybody Oh, I, well, for me, it, I do everybody just because I, you know, I don't leave any stone unturned. And even if you think somebody might not be a critical witness, um, they could end up being a really critical witness. I had one girl in the case. Um, she was only mentioned just what her name once um, in the court, in the police files. And um, I even had tracked down her friend before and her friend was like, oh, she won't know anything. But and just, but I still did it anyway. I still, you know, followed through and found her and talked to her. And she had the most um, critical stories of all. <laughs> so you just never know uh, with the witness. And you know, for me, especially, I don't know if it's just being like a female, um, people open up to me more. Um, and especially, you know, law enforcement is very intimidating. But when I'm calling them and just, you know, asking, it's a lot less intimidating. Um, people open up more. Um, I'm able to get a lot more information. Um, and, you know, almost everybody I called, they said, I've never told anybody this, or I've, I've never told the police this, you know, all these stories are now, they're finally telling me and telling the story. And I'm seeing, um, that's what I said, when it's going to be groundbreaking when the book and the show comes out, like people have no idea because 
with all these witnesses and all the news stories and information coming out, it's, it's really wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is there any times that you've actually been really scared? Whilst doing no. that? No. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I'm like a fearless person in general. It takes a lot to shake me. Um, no, I, you know, and especially when I'm working a case too, it's just like, um, I'm just so laser focused, whether I'm in the prison or whether I'm tracking down a witness, I'm just so laser, laser focused at all times. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that it's, it's like, what one of the reasons, I, uh, the main reason I wanted to get you on, on here was that the fact that I don't feel that there's enough female representation in media um i've had so many men on, on on here but i've fought to get women on to share their stories their wisdom um you, you know you you've, you've really pushed through some boundaries i yeah. suppose the only person that i know of that i could uh compare you to would be someone like Aaron Brockovich um, and that's only through yeah. um, the film yeah. you know it's honestly it's been really really hard and my friends um, uh, they saw me uh, break down not too long ago just um, hysterically and um, it was because you know I get so viciously attacked because of being a female in this field and just the constant, constant abuse, the constant um, attacks all the time, um, you know, and you're just trying to do a job and bring some girls home and work this case. And um, it's sad the way women are treated in this field and the way you're picked apart. And every single time I say one word or do anything, it's like, well, she touched her hair, she played with her hair, you know, uh, she said that word too many times. It's like every little thing I do is like under a microscope. Um, and um, I sit in the prison with them and I take a picture and it's, um, you know, I get attacked by thousands of people. What, then a man goes in and does the same thing and they're applauded for doing the same thing. So how does that feel, honestly? It's nice. you know, it does. You know, I didn't think we were this far behind of like for female investigators or females in the true crime field. Um, it's it's really sad. It's really sickening. Yeah. You see, I find that, you know, there is there still is that, um, you know, especially in Britain, um, in the entertainment industry, uh, in in the sort of podcasting industry, uh, in the law enforcement. Um, women are held to, I suppose, a higher standard than men, um, and they're picked apart more than men, um, and I think it's awfully sad, um, you know, I, I spoke to a, a, a lady called, um, Jasvinda Sanghera, she's a, a campaigner against forced marriage. Um, her parents tried to force her into marriage they forced her sister into marriage and she killed herself and she's the woman that got um, uh, you know it made it legal in this country for forced marriage and child marriage yet some of the abuse that she's got has been excuse me far beyond anything that a man would go through um, I've, I've been picked apart for, you know, doing this and, you know, I, I know some of my colleagues have been picked apart for, for doing this, but the female ones have really been under, under the microscope and I want to, I want to know why that is because, you know, we're not in the 1940s and 50s. 
women are the weaker sex um in a lot of aspects they're the stronger sex um i'm a father to girls strong independent girls i might add you know um my my 14 year old asked asked me the other week she said uh, dad i used to, i you know we got into a discussion about um domestic violence and and, and and things like that because she knows what i do and she said well dad I, are you scared of other men and i was like well not really I'm, I'm 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 not really scared of of men she said well apart from you and my stepdad i am because they're the ones that you know there's been murders near where she lives there's been violence and, and crime near where she lives and it, it, it's been caused by men and she's genuinely fearful of of men and, and the way that she's been you know the way that she could be treated by men and, and the violence that she could receive um, and that broke my heart as a parent um you know i've always brought her up to be strong and, and, and independent and not scared of much but actually to be scared of of of, of what's happening in, in in society today it's a heartbreaking thing I, I think you know for 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 mothers as well it's 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 a heartbreaking thing to think about and you know, I, I've always wanted my da daughters to be strong, independent. As much of a pain in the backside it, it, it can be, <laughs> you, you know, um, raising strong, independent women is isn't without its its um it, its problems because they're strong, they're independent, and they're coming up to teenage years, or they're in the teenage years, and they're getting gobby. So it's not easy as a parent. But, you know, e even at school, to a certain point, they're held to a different standard to the boys. And that's not equality. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to fight for equality, but it, that's not equality, is it? It's you know i mean we 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 we're not in the days of um you know the suffragettes and stuff like that but i think we still we've still got a long way to go yeah um yeah, we do and i would say even what's really probably the worst is um i think it's i get probably attacked i get some men but the majority i would say is women it's women attacking other women yeah that, that 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 must be a, a a more bitter pill to swallow when it's other women that are attacking you for what you do. I mean, it's sad. Um, it is really sad. I would never put down a woman. I would, all, you know, I always encourage women um, to go after their dreams. You know, higher education um, to get into this field to do this type of work. I think, you know, I want to push all women to succeed and become this way and become independent. And um, yeah, it's sad. It's really sad. You know? Yeah, I, I would imagine it is. I mean, it, it breaks my heart um, being a parent. I can only, I can't even imagine what it's, it's, it's like as a, as a woman, to be honest. I mean, I, like I say, I've, I've, been verbally attacked by other men for the, some of the things that I've I've brought in into light. You know, I I spent time with escapees of human trafficking. I, I've had threats from human traffickers. Um, I was I've been threatened by other men, but the most hurt I will say the most hurtful stuff has come from women. You know, uh, how can you uh, like like I've had people say to me, how can you even begin to understand? Or what a woman goes through um, 
and, and the mo one the, I, I think the one that hit the hardest was um, men can't understand rape because men can't be raped. Um, I struggle to see the uh, <laughs> the science in that um, because we they they can. Um, and I know from experience, but um, ignorance, I think it is. It's a lot to do with ignorance too. Yeah, um, lack of compassion, lack of empathy is just become such a norm in our society too. And I think that's why you know the crime, we're having crimes we're having now, and you know murders and the mass shootings. You know, it all stems from lack of compassion, lack of empathy, um, and that's like you said, ignorance too. Is it, is it fair as well? Um, you know, it, you, you can only put so much down to ignorance. Um, you can only put so much down to the lack of education. Um, some of it you can put down to fear. Um, lack of empathy. Um, but then again, I think that just because you're not a serial killer doesn't mean that you can't be a psychopath or a sociopath. Um, and I think when people like us start to show the world how it is, um, and start to bring things in that are uncomfortable for other people, when other people get uncomfortable or embarrassed for other people, that's when they bite out. Um, I've never been one for wanting to toe the line of comfort um, as you can probably tell I like to ask questions I like to hear the truth I'm one for the truth a man li that lived in so, so many lies I want to hear the truth um, and when people are confronted with that truth I think that it's down to their fight or flight well, you, you know, you, you you call it warrior instinct. I, I think that some have the coward instinct. They want to run, they want to hide. Um, you know, it'd be unfair to say coward, but, um, you know, that, that they have that incessant need for survival. And if that means dragging somebody down to their level verbally, by gaslighting or whatever, um, you know, I've I've seen it a lot in working through um, uh, work, working with Jason on on um, spotting narcissists. Um, you know, that's a very inherent part of a personality, and that's that goes deep. I goes very deep, and I don't, you know, we haven't even got time to talk about all that. Uh, that's going into a, a different level. Um, I just think it's awfully sad that um, when people like us start to show um, success, there is always someone out there that has an inherent need to sabotage it. Yeah, you, you know. Yeah, and I think that's a big factor too is uh, um, the success. And uh, for me, you know, I'm so young, and um, and no one's really seen someone this young in true crime yet. And not only that, no one's ever seen somebody pregnant on death row yet. Um, no one's ever seen anybody get maps of where bodies are and where you know buried evidence are. So there's a lot of like brand new stuff, and like you say, people get freaked out but when they it's brand new and there's new ways of thinking and um and this is really like trailblazing and there's a lot of hate that also goes along with that yeah yeah because you, yeah you're not you're not living to a standard that set you're setting your own standard and i think that's what gets people uncomfortable yeah. Um, y y you know, it's the fact that a young woman, a pregnant young woman, 
can defy the odds and, and, and not show fear and go and speak to some of the most dangerous people in, in, in I won't just say America, in the world and, and come out of it with a career. I mean, you know, you, you've got your book coming out, which is What Hell Is Like, is that right? Yeah, What Hell Is Like. Uh, and, and that's just about the toolbox killers. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, let's see if we've got any questions, shall we? Because I, I, I know that some people have uh, Been writing. commented. <laughs> um, so I'll just go through the comments. Uh, but, 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 but. Oh, uh, uh, Alyssa was was there. Oh, uh -huh. she is there. Um, problem with uh, Teresa Crowley said that um, psychopaths uh, can never be cured. Um, would you agree in that? I can't answer that one. Uh, just stay tuned for the show because that go we go that gets covered. That really gets covered hard. Um. Alyssa asked, I think that was a question for me, uh, I've heard people talk about portraying the bad guy on America's Most Wanted and then being stopped in the street by angry people. Has anyone ever done that to me? Um, no, <laughs> is, 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 is the easy, easy answer. I've been asked why and how I could get my head into uh, such a dangerous character, real life character. Um, and I, th I think it's through pure empathy of the victims, really. Um, Alyssa, uh, when we were talking about, um, when, when you were talking about sarcasm, uh, people with Asperger's can't pick up sarcasm. Um, are there any uh, serial killers out there with Asperger's? Um, I have to go back and look it up. You mean for, um, yeah, um, I have like all the psych valves like filed away for each one, but we're calling it right now, um, for each different one. Uh, most, I will say most of, um, all, all, I, every single one, um, probably has about five plus, uh, diagnoses of disorders. Um, Teresa Crowley, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was based on a true story. Is that right? It is. It was based on um, Ed Gein. Ed Gein. Um, and were they, w w was there incest involved in that? Um, in breeding? Not, not in breeding, uh, but he um, kept his mother's corpse. Psycho was based on him. Um, a lot of necrophilia. And the the skin lamps that was uh, him. Well, he wore wore the skin on his face. He had a full body suit of like skin. Um, he had the whole his whole house. He had lampshades, rugs. Um, yeah. Whoa. So so a bit like uh, Buffalo Bill, Silence of the Lambs. Is that, is that right? Is uh, yeah. Also based on him. They've based a lot. They've based a lot of characters in Hollywood on him. Uh, let's have a look. Um, Alyssa again says um, that's why I said just kill if someone hurt my kids. Not sure what I would do. I think that's down to what we've discussed really isn't it that yeah. fight or flight i you know have you got that warrior gene or have you got that you know i personally find that vengeance is a dish best served not at all um and, and that's coming from you know recent pain uh, in, in 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 loss 
Um, do, 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 do. So there's quite a few. Oh, Robin's here. Robin, yep. Hey, Robin. Uh, the people of CA, is that California? Um, yeah. Voted to reinstate the death penalty. Um, our governor took it upon himself. Is that right? That is correct. Who's, who's the governor of California at the minute then? I know it was Arnold for a while. Oh, uh, now it's Newsom. Right, and he, he, I, I presume he's pro, um, pro death penalty. Um, oh, I think um, Teresa Crowley about the Texas Chainsaw. I think you're thinking of, um, um, there was like an inbred family, um, but it wasn't um, Ed Gein. Um, it was based on another movie. Uh, Hills of Eyes. Um, yeah. uh, so, so uh, Rob, Robin is the woman that uh, one of the survivors. Yes, is that right? Yeah, Robin's. Uh, um, yep. To put a moratorium on the death penalty. One of my worst PTSD days. Um, I, 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 I can empathize with that, Robin, you know, I, I have, um, PTSD, my self-complex PTSD, um, I would imagine that would sort of really affect you from being a, you, you know, I, th I think that, please correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, in my experience, you go from victim to survivor, and then the only natural way to go from survivor is thriver. But um, vic uh, not victim mentality. The uh, survivor mentality is the dominant mentality in 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 a lot of people, and you know a lot of people never get past that, and they spend their lives surviving. Um, you know, just skating across. Um, I can only empathise with um, what you've been through, Robin. Um, you know, I, I can't even begin to understand. Uh, it's only through looking through the eyes of a, a serial killer myself that I can have a tiny bit of... tiny bit of uh, knowledge for that and, you know... I don't even know what to say, really. It's, it's you know. Um, Honestly, Robin is um, one of the strongest women I've ever, really, um, in all honesty, uh, for what happened to her. Um, you know, just what uh, Bideker and Norris were, uh, what they did to their victims. Um, you know, it's, it really is. It's, it's beyond, it's wild. Um, when Robin, and I first contacted Robin, um, this was right after Bideker had given me the info of the bodies. Um, I tracked her down and was able to find her. Um, and she, uh, I called her and uh, she was like, I haven't heard that name since, you know, um, that what, last time they, um, you know, she was going to trial for it, you know, identifying them. And Bideker put a very high price hit on her from the jail. Uh, multiple hits on her, actually, and multiple hits on another victim, a uh, surviving victim, Jan Mallon. Uh, Jan had to go into witness protection. Um, Paul Bynum showed up at her house in the middle of the night and had to get her out of the house um, because he was he had a lot of money. He was making uh, over $400,000 equivalent to this time. Um, so he had a lot of money and he kept putting hits on um, the victims and he wanted the van to be... Um, burned or put a bomb in it to have it explode in the police impound. Um, so yeah, when I contacted Robin, she had said to me, you know, um, this was her first question, like, am I working for him? Um, is that why I tracked her down? Um, yeah. Robin's, Robin just said, uh, now I wish Bisky was still alive uh, for the final search, but I'm good now, Jack. We're actually... Um, oh. Rob and I are going to be, she's picking me up from the airport. 
we're going to be going to all the sites and uh we, we have um it's going to be fun we got uh we're seeing a couple of hotels and we're going to go to the police departments and start you know hitting this case hard uh but we actually after i talked to robin that first time when i was pregnant um I was, I didn't want, I wanted to meet Robin, but I was so scared to ask her because, you know, she <laughs> didn't know exactly who I was or what I was doing yet. Um, so uh, what we she actually said to me, she goes, uh, I, you know, I have to meet you. She's like, I want to meet you. And she wanted to listen to my interview tapes with Bideker. And we met at a Starbucks in San Jose and we sat there for hours and she listened to, you know, all the interviews with Bideker. Um, we're just sitting there with their little headphones on listening to him. Um, but that was our first meeting. So we haven't seen each other since that because of COVID. Um, so it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be a three after three years meeting back up reunion. Yeah. And we're gonna have um, GoPros, we're gonna have everything filmed, um, going at all times. Um, we are working, we are um, working on a second show, a second, uh, we're pitching out. Um, the next, and this will be focused on, you know, the searches. This is going to be for the girls, the unknown victims, um, identifying some of the Jane Doe's and some of the missings, as well as, you know, doing the dig for the buried evidence. I think if we can find the buried evidence, that's going to be what's going to blow everything wide open. Um, that is why Bideker, um was held in contempt in court. He wouldn't give it over because he knew um, the buried evidence site had all the other victims, way more than the five victims. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, buried evidence is the skeleton key for the other victim. So, so when's, um, when's the documentary due and um, when can people in America see it and when can we see it in the UK? Uh, which one did the toolbox? Yeah. Uh, I don't have an official date. Um, as far as the toolbox killers. So all I know is, uh, I know what pretty much everybody in the public knows, uh, it's airing in the fall. Uh, I wouldn't ask you actually, do you guys, you guys don't get oxygen, but you're, are you still able to watch it? Um, I think that we can, I think your discovery channel is our true crime network. Um, so I think that it works that way. I know that the uh, Twisted um, and the other episode uh, I did um, for Locked Up Abroad, they're both um, in cooperation with Oxygen. So I think they're, they're on, uh, I think the first one might have been on this year already, but um, I think um, probably or um, your f fall, um, probably on either the Discovery Channel or, or the True Crime Network over here. I'd, you probably see m me before I see me, to be honest, it, it, it's going to be shown over there. If I'd be interested in, in um, see if I could get hold of it, it it'd, be, it'd be great. I'm finding out what people think about it, really. Um, but yeah, um, either, it's either that or troll the internet for, I don't know, um, downloads or uh, I think Discovery Channel's now got an app. Um, I know after it airs, you can um watch it on oxygen.com i don't know if it's the same for europe though well i've got vpn so i might be able to uh have a look at that um yeah um it'd be great if you could let me know if you do see it because um i'd be quite gonna, interested in that um i was gonna tell you you look um just like him Would you say so? Uh, I you know, I, I the game of the round glasses and yeah, I definitely see a resemblance. Yeah, I I think it. I I I didn't. Um, I've spent many years battling with my weight, mainly not being able to put it on. Um, and over these past few years since I got out of hospital and I've stopped smoking, I've just 
I blown so I've, I've I've got up to sixteen and a half stone, which is what about one hundred eighty four pounds or something. Um, you know, so I, I think now I've filled out in the face, I do look a bit more like him, which is why I, th I think that they sort of took to me. Um, but I didn't know who I was playing when I got there. I just got asked to go and uh, get involved, which was nice. Um, so we'll look. Yeah, I guess. Um, oh. oh, no, I was going to say, if anybody Sorry? has questions, go ahead and post them up. Yeah, 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 that'd be great. Um, Robin said that was a freezing day. Um, when you, met, I presume that's when you met when you were talking about um, being in the restaurant and stuff. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, you know, if 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 you come up with any questions afterwards, um, I can you know I can put them to Laura and I'm sure she can find some time to film a response for you um, I, I know that I get a, a lot of viewers that um, don't come in on the live um, like I say when I started it was eight o'clock quarter past eight here um, you know and it, uh, I think some people just um, find it on catch up um, if you want to watch this on catch up, this will be on uh, the Accidental Journalist uh, Facebook page. Um, it should still be on Laura's personal page and those that I tagged. Um, from tomorrow, um, hopefully, it will be on my website, which is jwgreg dot wordpress dot com if you click on the accidental journalist tab it shows you everything that i've done up to now all 30 odd um uh webcasts um, so all my friends um or who are watching um, um share this uh, jack wants some american followers so you know please share this and uh we'll get you some more following for america that, that that would be great. I mean, I've noticed that since you know, since I announced this, uh, we have had about, I suppose, a, a hundred people um, like the like the um, Facebook page. Um, most of them from America. Um, you know, I know you have your followers and your fans. Um, I know that you have a presence on uh, Instagram and stuff like that. Um, I'll put out the link on Instagram as well. Um, I know a lot of people um, that follow my stuff don't have Facebook, um, which is why I um, opened up the YouTube channel and 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 my web page. Um, we don't really have any subscribers on the web page. Uh, it's got the accidental, uh, not the web page on on the YouTube page. We have about nine, but that is just really. Uh, a dump for these videos so I can then link them to the website so I don't have to worry about subscribers so I don't have to worry about views and people have got the access all in one place which is on on the WordPress site um, brilliant there don't see there doesn't seem to be any more questions um, I think most people uh, you, you know a few people uh, Teresa said brilliant interview um, Don who's one of my admins, said, uh, thank you, Laura and Jack, for tonight. Uh, Melanie Jacob says, uh, Jacobson, who's an absolutely lovely woman, um, who's, done, you know, uh, a part, she, she sent us a couple of international boxes as a family. Um, it's where I got my love of uh, salt of pe uh, salt of peanut rolls. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I can say about that. Um do, 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 do. Uh, Lisa Russo, love you, Robin. You're an amazing woman. Um, another one from Dawn. Bless you. Love. Hope you do get a good sleep tonight. I know. I don't sleep much. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, 
Teresa, am I anyone who goes for what they want? This woman is doing them um, amazing. Uh, people are just jealous. Well, thank you. Um, I think we've got a question. Uh, Robert Marchione, forgive me if I've uh, said that wrong. Um, do you plan on releasing an autobiography? And if so, when um, and can I have a signed one? Um, I do at some point. I do at some point. Um, yeah, maybe I'll get some more material for it soon. <laughs> I guess it's just finding time in, in a a busy schedule, isn't it? Yeah. Um, time is one commodity that a, a, a lot of us don't have anymore. Um, do, do, do. Uh, Nathan Penfold, this is very interesting. I read a study on how people who are interested in mass murder cases have an extremely high IQ. I've heard that. I've heard um, there's a, um, studies have shown a higher IQ for people um, into this subject. Um, Teresa said we have a few when we were talking about serial killers uh, we have a few here in the UK but fortunately the UK isn't as big as America um, Rose and Fred West um, they were uh, seemingly I don't know if you know about them they were a seemingly normal couple who killed uh, a lot of women over the years together and buried, under the, buried them under the foundation of their house um, he killed himself in prison. He hung himself. Um, Dennis Nielsen, um, the, uh, he was a killed uh, young man. He was a uh, young gay man. Uh, a few have been caught, fortunately. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't have stopped killing. Um, Rose West was in the same prison I was, but in a different wing, thank God. Um, that's the thing about our prisons, you know. Um, uh, we, we have categories like A cat to sort of like C and D cat, and um, yeah, so you, you have a very good chance of bumping into a serial killer um, if you just. Uh, <laughs> maybe a violent faith um Don blade said who would you interview again again um all of them i don't think uh <laughs> i can ask, ask this question um uh you know <laughs> um so yeah seriously um i always have questions <laughs> Yeah, I, I suppose that comes with um, a certain type of mind, doesn't it? Like, um, I'll probably finish this, uh, well, when I finish this interview in a few minutes, I'll, I'll I'll take some time to wind down and then I'll, I'll go back through it in my head thinking, should have asked that, or should have asked that. And I do it with every interview. I, I, I think it's very much retrospect. Um, you know, so I think that you can go back to just keep asking. Um, yeah, at almost every interview I've walked out of the prison and right when I um, hear the door, like the prison doors like steel shut, I'll think, oh my God, I should ask that. Why didn't I ask that? Like you, you do. Um, there's always more questions you want to go back and ask. Yeah. Uh, Victoria Hart says, how do you, how did you de-stress after interviewing Bittica? So I do a ritual. Um, I just started doing this ritual myself um, after I go to death row. Um, I treat myself for a, a last meal. So I go out and I usually get like a steak and lobster, like serpent turf, and I 
just get like a drink and I just sit by the water because it's right on the San Francisco Bay. Just eat alone, but I have my last meal alone by myself. So that's my, my death row um, decompress ritual that I do. Wow. Yeah, I, I would imagine that. that, that would have... Did you ever like, do you think that's psychologically like, because it's death row and, and, and you're thinking about their last meal, is it, uh, is, is it like you connecting with them? You know, maybe. Um, it's, yeah, I think so. I think what if this was my last meal, so I treat myself to a last meal because you, when you even first stand put in death row um, to even go on to East Block where you have to go, um, you actually have to pass the uh, gas chamber. So you see the gas chamber on your way in. Yeah. Um, so you're very reminded of where you are, that you're on death row. And it's, yeah, so I guess I do always have that in mind with like the last meal and that. And um, but then it's also like a treat that I actually, you know, went in there and they're not short interviews. I'm in there for five hours. Uh, you have to sit outside in the freezing cold for three hours before you even get in the door. Um, so it's, it's like, and you have to be there um, five o'clock in the morning. Um, it's freezing cold right on the water. Uh, again, you have to wait and then you get the five hours in. So, I mean, it's like a, it's a hard day. So it's also like a reward to myself. Um, and for the psychological things that I'm doing that I might not even be aware of to myself, you know, by going in there and hearing the truth. So just, be, just before we finish, can you take me through, like, like you said, you, you, you know, you're, you're, um, you're there at 5 a.m., um, and, and then, you know, you go in there for five hours. Um, what is the process? You, you, you say you pass the, um, the gas chambers. Um, you know, what, what, what is the process? You know, do you go in? Are you searched? What, what, um, yeah, you know, you what's the process between you. there and getting to some more like Bittica? Um, well, they have, you go up to the gate um, and it's a, uh, the visiting, you can check in at this separate building. It's uh, very far from where you have to walk to the actual death row in the prison. Uh, but once you go in there, you check in, you have to show your ID, you have to have a clear bag. You're not allowed to bring anything with you except for one car key. Um, ten, you're allowed 10 pieces of paper, um, one car key, that's pretty much it. And um, you know they check you in, look over your ID and everything. They check your bag and then they look you over head to toe from appearance. Um, and women get hit first because um, you have to be appropriately dressed to go into the prisons. And um, San Quentin, you're not allowed to wear jeans because the uniforms are denim, and that can be confused for you know what they wear. You can't wear anything green too because green is what the correctional officers wear. So it's there's some weird stuff. Ar ironically, they tell you to actually dress like you're going to a funeral um, for death row. If you to pass criteria, I mean, I always just wear a black suit, and I look. I'm always trying to look professional when I go in, um, so it's not too hard for me. Uh, but yeah, you have to. It has to be up to the collarbone for a woman, um, uh, just at the knee. Uh, for if you wear a dress or a skirt, um, but that's it's a pretty. But they look you head to toe, and they will take you even like by inch by inch. They'll pull out the measuring tape and everything. So once you get past that, then you have to go through um, metal detectors and your, even your clear bag has to go through, um, security, like you would at the airport and everything and you keep the wand over you, even as a clear check. Um, and then you walk, you have to walk all the way down um, and then you have to turn, actually you have to turn left. And um, that's when you see there's North Sec, you're gonna pass North Sec first. That's like where the um, well-behaved death row inmates go. Then um, there's a gas chamber, and then there is East Block, and that is where typically my interview um, East Block is like uh, just the general part of the death row. Wow. Um, so I find that um, buildings carry their own energy. Um, I struggled to go visit my brother in prison um you know years ago because the, the certain thoughts and, and and certain routines that are embedded within me that i 
I don't like. Um, and I find that buildings carry a certain negative energy. Yeah, um, thing. Yeah, and I would imagine that uh, gas chambers really would carry a heavy negative energy. Uh, you know, how does that affect you? You know, are you? Can I ask? Are you, are you um, pro death penalty or? Um, you know, I don't really have a on it exactly. You know, I for myself and like people in forensic psychology, I think they should be kept alive for study um, purposes. But as far as whether we should or we shouldn't, I really have a stance on that. I just think they should for research purposes. Um, you know. I'm always in that research mind. I'm a researcher, so. Um, I think that's fair. Um, Victoria Hart again. Um, I was discussing with a friend why do serial killers disclose so much more to women in some instances? Would love to know what you think. Um, well, you know, especially like Mary O'Toole, who, who's going to be on the show, who's an FBI profiler, and she does tons of work. She's just like me, like her and I just love to be in the prisons, in the field and interviewing. It's, it's, it's our passion, it's what we're good at. I think the reason for that is because, you know, when a man goes in, um, it's almost like more intimidating for the inmates too. And for a woman, um, things can trigger them subconsciously. Like when I was pregnant and stuff like that, um, I found out later, you'll read in the book, um, I wear a cross and that it was a huge trigger subconsciously for Bideker, which I didn't realize until the very end. Um, and you'll find out why for that, um, I'm trying to think. And women, I think, are more uh, compassionate and empathetic and have a gentler you know, tone to them. So I think it's easier for them to open up uh, to, to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I could understand that. I haven't got a gentle tone. This, this is my accent. This is how I sound. So, you know, I, I can come across as quite condescending at times, not meaning to. That's that's the thing about being a Yorkshireman. I can say what I think is the nicest thing in the world and it'll come across as sarcastic or condescending. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. I, I don't think it's something I could do. Um, I think that, that, you know, like I've said, um because I'm an honest person and I, I keep myself open and I keep these interviews open. I, I you know, I've, I've been told that that's why people tend to open up a bit more um, to me on, on, on these and because it's live as well. I think um, I, I don't really prepare questions. Um, I like to go from the heart and off the cuff, which is why I sometimes stutter. But... Um, you know, um, it's been absolutely amazing to finally get to talk to you. Yeah, um, about it for a while. Um, maybe, yeah. Um, oh, maybe um, in a few weeks um, we could do something. Me and Robin, if Robin, you're up for it. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I extend my hand. Um, I, I would love to get uh, you know you and Robin on. Um, all, all in your own time, um, you know, no pressure, um, y you know, anybody else that, 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 that is involved in the case, really, um, yeah, Robin says she's up for it, um, we'll arrange it, that would be brilliant, um, that would, that would be, there's so many questions that, that, that I would have for, for, for Robin, um, you know, about uh, survivorship and, uh, you, you know, uh, trauma response and, 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 and things like that. Because, it, you, know, you know, she's um, obviously been through more extreme things than I have. Um, so, yeah, I don't, yeah, we'll arrange that, Robin. That would be absolutely fantastic, it, um, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll end on this note uh, for everybody to... Um... So uh, yeah, three weeks, it's 21 days from today. Um, it's gonna be the first time since COVID, you know, we can actually get out there and uh, hit the ground running on the case. 
So big things are about to happen in three weeks. Fantastic. Um, I would love it if you could keep us posted. Oh, I will, um, definitely. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to get you on again as well. Um, after, you know, um, after it airs, um, and we can possibly break that down. You know, I'll, I'll get a of a copy some, somewhere <laughs> and we'll, we'll break it down and we'll, we'll talk about that that would be fantastic um that's brilliant um if you stay on the uh stay on the line for a, a, a little while and i'll just wind down and then i'll just have a quick debrief with you if that's okay guys thank you so much for tuning in thank you for all your input um it has been an absolutely fantastic night. I've learned so much um, about the psychology of, of killers and so much about Laura. It's been an absolute pleasure to um, just get her involved. Um, I've, I've got a couple more booked, a couple more people booked. I'm, I'm not going to say anything yet. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a couple of... Uh, big names but um you know thank everybody for tuning in uh, and inputting your questions um again thanks to my sponsors uh, to those people that make it possible um it's just absolutely brilliant and with that guys i'm gonna say good night i'll see you soon <laughs>